Chapman. I'm the medical director for SMM GP and I'm also a GP in Birmingham and I'm delighted to welcome you to this which is the fourth in our series of webinars looking at medical cannabis in the UK. Uh, this has been made possible by an unrestricted educational grant from Althea so many, many thanks to them and we still have two more um, webinars to follow this one so stay tuned for those and I'm sure they'll be just as good. Uh, on that line, uh, SMMGP runs a number of educational uh, webinars and other um, CPD uh, through our premium membership category. And if you enjoy this webinar, please go and have a look at that and then um, click the links and, and hopefully get a lot more CPD. So when we're going through this today, we will have a couple of little polls which you just click on and um, and, and, and enter your response as we go through and they'll be fed back quite quickly so please click them uh, as they come up and then at the end of the day we, we, at the end of the session we have uh, question and answers with David and if you type your questions through they'll all come up here and I'll moderate them so we're not asking the same question over and over again but we'll, we'll have plenty of time at the end uh, to go through those with David so uh, with no further ado I'd like to introduce you to uh, Professor David Nutt, who is the head of the Centre for Neuropsychopharmacology at Imperial. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be online talking to you all tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about medical cannabis and the UK situation. And I'm going to be sharing with you uh, slides which have been made by the charity I set up called Drug Science. And if you want access to any of these slides, just go on our website and uh, you can see them, you can download them. Feel free to use them for your own personal learning. Share them with your colleagues, particularly your juniors and medical students. And use them for any teaching you might want to do. So I'm going to look at a number of different aspects of medical cannabis, starting from what I think is necessary to really get an understanding of what the issues are, which is the uh, um, role of uh, the law in medical cannabis. So if you want to read more about this, I, I, I gave a lecture on this about a year ago, and it was published in the BMJ in May, and um, it's a very... Uh, succinct, just 2,000 word uh, account of the history and the politics of cannabis. It's not a, not a pleasant read because it's a, a great deal of uh, misinformation has been spread around uh, medical cannabis. But if you want access to this kind of information, and I guess most of you probably are members of the BMA, then feel free to read this, uh, this essay. And in it, I talk about the ancient history of medical cannabis, as on this slide. And it is uh, quite remarkable. You can argue that cannabis may be the world's oldest medicine recorded back nearly 3000 BC in China, um, used there to treat over 100 ailments, including gout, rheumatism, and malaria. The one the particular reference I rather like is the 200 AD one, when uh, the Chinese uh, definition of uh, anesthesia became cannabis intoxication. Uh, and we've seen also widespread use of cannabis as a medicine in, uh, in India and other countries, uh, including Egypt. But the UK story starts in 1689 when uh, this drug called Banga was brought to the Royal Society and tested by William Hook, who was the president who said it had a peculiar and interesting effect on the mind. And uh, not much happened then for uh, 100 years or 150 years when uh, William O'Shaughnessy opened up dispensaries and published his pharmacopoeia on the uh, use of cannabis. And uh, it was a pretty up-to-date uh, pharmacopoeia because most of what he was saying is what people use cannabis for today, such as rheumatism, tetanus, and convulsions. And the most popular user uh, we, of cannabis, we believe, was certainly one of the most famous users, was Queen Victoria. And uh, her personal physician, Dr. Russell Reynolds, wrote the definitive text, 40 pages or so, in The Lancet in about 1880s, um, on the benefits of cannabis. And we believe that Queen Victoria used it to ease the pain of periods and also of childbirth. <laughs> 
But the his cannabis has always been clouded by concerns about uh, misuse. And the first of these was in the 1890s when uh, prohibitionist, uh, abstentionist politicians argued that the uh, British government's reliance on money from selling cannabis in India, uh, this was one of the great uh, markets for the East India Company, was selling cannabis to the Indians, making them buy British cannabis instead of eat, uh, you smoking their own from the side of the streets, was leading to a moral decay in India. And the Indian Health Commission did an extremely detailed analysis and, uh, and the results were really what we uh, have forgotten for the last hundred years, which was essentially that moderate use didn't cause physical or psychological harm. Which, the reason we've forgotten the results of the hemp <laughs> oh, sorry, um, was uh, because the Americans, the USA, decided to make marijuana a drug of misuse, a drug that... Uh, they could use to justify the continued existence of the Drug Enforcement Agency. You're probably aware that uh, alcohol prohibition in the USA was not a very successful initiative. It led to every single policeman being corrupt. And uh, the US government then had to set up a separate force, the, what is now called the Drug Enforcement Agency, and then they were called the Untouchables to basically fight the mafia and to try to control alcohol prohibition. And uh, they didn't really succeed, but uh, in the 1930s, the Senate voted to liberalize alcohol, make it legal again. And the head of the uh, DEA, Harry Anslinger, was faced with the prospect of losing his status as the most, or second most famous man in America, uh, and to lose his army of 35,000 people. So he decided to create a new fear, which was cannabis. And to make it more hysterical and more threatening, he changed his name to marijuana, the Mexican name, so he could scare people into the idea that Mexicans were crossing the border, stoned on marijuana, and doing very indecent things to uh, white women, and also corrupting the youth. And uh, you can see from these some of these images, it's a usual hysteria about youth and sex that was um, was basically been used by every drug anti-drug campaign ever since uh, and uh, the Americans bought into that and uh, since then they've been fighting a war on marijuana now in order to justify fighting the war marijuana had to be vilified and the way the US government set out about doing that was to pressurized the League of Nations to say there was no bene medical benefits. That way they could stop allowing American doctors to prescribe it. And you note a very a great interest that British, British doctors didn't concede that, and they didn't concede in fact until 1971. And then in 1961, when the first of the UN conventions on narcotic drugs came along, there was a vociferous Egyptian doctor who blamed most of the admissions in Egyptian Egypt psychiatric hospitals to cannabis and he persuaded the Americans that they should ban it internationally and the Americans actually didn't particularly want to do that but that was a deal they had to cut to get some air bases in Egypt and in 1968 the war on drugs when Nixon was facing defeat because of the war in Vietnam wasn't going very well he started a new war close to home which everyone could sign up to the war on drugs which we've been fighting ever since and in Britain, medical cannabis was a medicine until 1971. Uh, uh, but eventually, having faced decades of pressure from the US to comply with their regulations, uh, the Misuse of Drugs Act banned cannabis. And the justification was that there were two GPs in Labrook Grove who were prescribing cannabis and telling people to drop cannabis tincture onto cigarettes and smoke it. And uh, rather extreme to ban a drug simply because two doctors are misusing it but as I say it was about complying with the uh, persistent US pressure to have cannabis banned. They believe that by banning it as a medicine they get rid of recreational use. In 1971 there were half a million recreational users of cannabis in Britain and 20 years later there were 10 million.
So the banning didn't actually do any good. It might even have increased use. But what it did do was stop medical use. And it's only in the last year or so that medical use has come back. And this next slide is one of the number of case studies you'll see if you go through our slide set. But Billy Cordwell is the one that is perhaps uh, the most influential because it was Billy that changed the law. And uh, Billy, as you can read from this, was is a, a, a lad with autism who has an extremely severe epilepsy and he has thousands of seizures a month. He wasn't doing at all well on the combination of medicine, anti-epileptic medicines he was getting in the UK. So his mother took Billy to the US and Canada to try, to try cannabis oil, which worked. And she came back to the UK but could not uh, get it prescribed. The GP in Northern Ireland who prescribed it was confronted by the GMC with a threat of gross medical misconduct if he continued to prescribe. He was at that time prescribing it to be delivered from Southern Ireland era. So she went away back to get her son treated and then when he was well she came in to Heathrow with him and some cannabis oil uh, and then the drugs were confiscated uh, in a fairly um, emotional interaction with the customs officers who didn't want to but were forced to by the law and within a few days Billy was in intensive care likely to die because he hadn't been given his medication and the Home Secretary then acceded to the public outcry and gave Billy's mother a license to use cannabis and soon after Alfie Dingley a similar case came forward and the Home Secretary decided it was just too difficult to issue independent licenses to do research for each of these separate children. So the Chief Medical Officer in um, September 2018 conceded that uh, medicine, cannabis was in medicine. And on the 1st of November, uh, cannabis was moved out of Schedule 1, very dangerous drugs where they were alongside crack cocaine, into Schedule 2 prescribable drugs, where they're alongside much more dangerous drugs such as heroin. They also, having though they made it possible to prescribe, they put a number of conditions on the prescribing. For instance, they can only be prescribed by specialists, although it's a fact that once a specialist has started prescribing, it is possible for a GP to then take over under their guidance. There must be clear evidence of safety and efficacy, which uh, is certainly possible if you listen to patients and look at international evidence but is not necessarily the kind of evidence that most doctors are used to which is controlled trials done by drug companies and they're unlicensed so they're only available on named patient basis you have to try other medicines and getting unlicensed products that are scheduled to in from overseas is very difficult there are many hurdles it costs a huge amount of money so no one's doing it. In fact, there have only been 16 prescriptions of medical cannabis on the NHS in the last uh, 14 months. NICE has decided that there are some conditions which they will support um, cannabis medicines. These children with severe forms of epilepsy, adults with nausea and uh, vomiting due to chemotherapy, uh, which for which drugs like Nabilone are a license and of course Sativex in adults with muscle pain due to multiple sclerosis. So I'm going to say a little bit about each of these products. Sativex is a, a, a patented compound, you're probably all aware of it, it was licensed for spasticity in adult patients with multiple sclerosis. It's a natural cannabis product which has a ratio of one to one THC and CBD and uh, the average dose which is sprayed into the mouth is um, about three milligrams of each and you can use it up to four times a day. It's not cheap, it costs uh, 120 pounds a 10 mil var which is one of the reasons it was actually uh, rarely used and was actually not supported by NICE but they've actually conceded that it is a viable medicine, it does have a license and given the pressure to loosen up the regulations on medical cannabis it's now been made more available. You can see the nice analysis is uh, that it costs 50,000 pounds a year for one disability adjusted life year, which makes it actually 
uh, as I say, outside of what NICE would concede as a, a, a acceptable threshold. But um, they were forced, I think, for pub out, due to the public outcry to do something about it. But it's not really recommended. And very few people get it on the NHS. Uh, not very many get it privately either because of the price. And not all patients like it. One of the interesting things we've learned, and drug science has been researching this field uh, in terms of discourse with patients and prescribers for over a year now, is that many people do not get the kind of benefits from Sativex that one would have predicted. And that's because it's not a full product. It's basically an extract containing THC and cannabidiol. Some people find that the THC is too strong and there's no way they can titrate it. And then we have the two THC analogs, dronabinol and nabilone. Ones, they're both uh, structurally the same as THC, but they come from, they're made as opposed to extracted from the plant. And uh, nabilone is licensed in the UK. It's a Schedule II drug and it can be used for vomiting. So it is used perhaps, I think, about 100 prescriptions a year. And then on the right hand column, you have epidiolex. Now, epidiolex is cannabidiol. It's, uh, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute, but it's uh, epidiolex is an extract of the plant that is grown just to make cannabidiol. So it's a variant of the hemp plant. It's been approved in the FDA for various forms of child hep epilepsy. It's licensed in the UK for Dravet and Lennox Gastaut syndrome as an addition on top of clobazam, the benzodiazepine anticonvulsant. The problem with the current regulations are that an unlicensed medicine uh, under Schedule 2 means that doctors have to take responsibility for prescribing the drug. So the, basically the, uns, the, the unlicensed medication title means that it's, uh, your trust won't assume responsibility. You have to assume it yourself, which scares off quite a lot of doctors. Uh, there are some clinics now which are taking on the responsibility of insurance, but uh, there aren't so many of those yet. So that is a problem. I mean, the reality is, of course, that cannabis medicines are exceptionally safe, but there is, it is still quite hard work to prescribe them. And the bottom right-hand side of this image, you, you see the impact that the war on drugs had. You can see that cannabis, particularly when people started to understand about cannabis receptors, there was a big up surge in research publications relating to uh, the cannabis and then the war on drugs 1971 the second UN convention it collapsed and it's only in the last decade that publications have started coming back and this uh, this is really a vivid example of how the war on drugs has had actually zero impact on recreational use as I explained over that over the, the 40 years since 1971 there's been a 20-fold increase in recreational use in Britain, America, almost all Western countries. And uh, so, so the, the banning has had an almost no impact at all on recreational use, but it's completely stifled research. And so now we're in this horrible situation where patients are using these uh, drugs illegally because they get benefit, but doctors are saying, well, there's no research. And the reason there's no research is because of this failed attempt to try to stop people using the drug recreation. So here are just a couple of quotes and it is extremely distressing as we have been doing working with the parents of children who have to sell their homes, take out huge loans, fly overseas on a regular basis to try to get medicine for their children. People are paying now often over a thousand pounds a month for medication for children who have intractable epilepsy here and who are quite likely to die if they don't get it prescribed. But there are very few doctors prepared to prescribe it and those that do prescribe it are in the private sector and therefore and there the costs are still very high. Now one of the big issues that's continually flagged by people who don't want to prescribe cannabis is that it could be harmful. Well, of course, all medicines could be harmful. And uh, the react that if we find people complaining that it causes schizophrenia, cognitive impairment, and addiction. But the truth is, and we now have a lot of data, we have met some American states have had medical cannabis for over 10 years. 
And we don't see an increase in schizophrenia. We don't see much in the way of cognitive impairments. And we don't see a lot of addiction in people who get it medically. And the reasons for that are very straightforward. They're, one, they're getting balanced mixtures that aren't strong in THC. And it's the strong THC that makes you more vulnerable to each of these three separate disorders. Uh, and two, what they're getting has got cannabidiol with it. And cannabidiol protects against these negative effects of THC. In fact, people now are using cannabidiol to treat cannabis use disorder and also schizophrenia because it seems to have been an antidote to THC. So again, we've created harms from cannabis by making it illegal and forcing people to the black market, which is largely uh, a market of strong THC containing products called skunk. But there are some side effects of cannabis on the left hand side. Sometimes it can cause a drop in blood pressure, which is called a whitey. Uh, you can sometimes vomit or collapse. Some people get anxious and confused, and some people get paranoid, and some people get hunger. Paranoia is not uncommon. It is not schizophrenia. The paranoid feelings dissipate as soon as the um, cannabis has left your body. And it's actually one of the main reasons people don't end up becoming dependent on cannabis and using it as much, for instance, or as long as they do smoking cigarettes. Palpitations, it can incre increase blood pressure and heart rate as well as dropping blood pressure. But these are all relatively short-term effects. And to be honest, they're not in any sense more problematic than the side effects of other drugs that we use regularly on the right-hand side of this slide. Now, one of the reasons people uh, have come to be much more interested in the cannabis medicines is the discovery that they actually work on a system in the brain called the endocannabinoid system. So cannabis medicines seem to have in the body some kind of replicates of them. And there are, this, is, this slide distinguishes the endocannabinoids from the phytocannabinoids. So when with phytocannabinoids, we're talking about drugs like THC and cannabidiol, which we're prescribing. But with the endocannabinoid system, these natural substances, there are two big ones. One's called two arachidyl glycerol, which we're going to call 2-AG for short, and the others are nandamide. And you can see these are very complex molecules. And in fact, what they are, are they're products, degradation products of cell membranes, and endocannabinoids are released when neurons fire. And they work on cannabis receptors, the same receptors that THC and, uh, to some extent, CBD work on. So these, these cannabis receptors are called the CB1 and the CB2 receptor family. The CB1s are in the brain. The CB2s are, are much more located, much heavily, much more densely located on white blood cells. There's a very wide expression of cannabis-1 receptors in the brain. There are more CB1 receptors in the brain than all of the dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline receptors put together. These are the most common of the G protein coupled receptors, which helps explain why people with many, many different brain disorders may get benefit from cannabis because these receptors are all over the brain. And the signaling is complicated, it's shown on this slide, but very simply, endocannabinoids provide what we call a retrograde signaling. When you stimulate a, ner a nerve fires, most of the neurons in your brain release glutamate, Glutamate activates a postsynaptic neuron, uh, and when that neuron is activated, endocannabinoids are released in a kind of negative feedback way. So they act to inhibit and stabilize presynaptic release, but they also may be important in laying down memories by stabilizing a particular synaptic connection. There's just a little bit more detail on these two major systems they have a rather different role. One of them, the 2AG system on the left, it, it provides that kind of tonic activity uh, uh, in the brain, and the anandamide is more a phasic activity, it's much more stress-related. So, so they probably have complementary roles, one setting a background level of activity and the other driving um, changes in, uh, that are necessary following nerve activity. activity. So I've talked about this already. Here's a THC tetrahydrocannabinol 
and here's cannabid dial. Now, cannabid dial, it doesn't activate directly the CB1 receptors, but it can alter in a, what we call an allosteric way activity at the CB1 receptor. And finally, I just want to talk to you a bit about what drug science is doing. So, uh, we were horrified to discover that despite cannabis having been in medicine in November, since November 1918, there were no prescriptions. And over the last six months, we've set up a project called 2021. We've done it in collaboration with an organized charity called the UPA, the United Patients Alliance, who tell us they have over 20,000 people breaking the law every day to get access to medicinal cannabis. And we thought that was very undesirable for a number of reasons. Firstly, breaking the law is not a good thing. Secondly, what they get has no provenance, no proof of quality. It can be too strong. It can be variable in, in terms of strength and quantity and quality. Uh, and um, thirdly, no one's collecting any data. There's no black market has no interest in data collection. So we decided to do something about it and we set up this complex but powerful uh, network there's a project team where we have a clinician, Chloe Sackle, directing it. We have uh, Michael Linsky, a professor of epidemiology, who's going to be analyzing the data. And we, we're going to be supporting prescribing of up to 20,000 to 20,000 patients over the next two years. And all the data is going to be collected through a very sophisticated web-based uh, inventory um, called CB2 Insights. This has uh, been developed in Canada and has already been used to collect data on over 10,000 Canadians that are having medical cannabis. And we're going to use this to generate the kind of clinical insights, uh, both in terms of good effects and bad effects, that we hope Department of Health, NHS England, etc., will be able to use in a year or two to make sensible decisions about where in the NHS uh, cannabis can be prescribed. And to oversee all this, on the left-hand side, we have a scientific oversight board. There are a whole series of, in, of serious senior academics, each of which is taking on one of the particular subtopics that we're going to do. So, for instance, Eileen Joyce is going to monitor the study in Tourette's. Val Curran's going to monitor the studies in cannabis use disorders, etc. And what we're doing actually is what the, the Department of Health and Social Care recommended in their uh, report on medical cannabis last year when they discovered, they pointed out what we all knew, that there were terrible barriers to accessing cannabis. And they recommended that everyone should work with industry and academia to scope the development of a national UK patient registry to collect a uniform data set across all indications for patients prescribed a cannabis-based product for medicinal use in the United Kingdom. Well, they said it should be done. They're not doing it. They can't afford to do it. Uh, they know how to do it. But we're doing it for them, and we've had dialogues with them now, and they're very pleased that we are doing this. Obviously, the product has to be supplied. We've got, uh, I think, seven companies here. They're all going to, they've all agreed to provide material effectively at cost price, no more than £150 a month, to 4,000 patients each. And that's why we're confident we can reach the 20,000 patients in the next two years. We'll be collecting data from the existing medical records and putting that in into the, the data set before people get prescribed. We're going to be monitoring what products they use, what the doses are, what the adverse effects. We're going to have patient reported outcome measures across all indications because experience and research tells us that one of the great strengths of cannabis-based medicines is that people feel better they don't necessarily have any greater efficacy in perhaps what you might call the primary symptom, but they definitely improve things like sleep quality, quality of life and mood. So we're collecting those data on everyone that goes into this um, database. And then you can see for the specific indications, and these are the seven indications we're targeting. For chronic pain, we're using the brief pain inventory form. For anxiety disorder, we're using the GAD7. For post-traumatic stress disorder, the DSM-5 checklist for Tourette's, the Yale Tick Severity Score for multiple sclerosis, the expanded disability scale, for substance use disorder, the severity of dependence scale, and for epilepsy, the patient-weighted quality of life and the number of seizures. So we're collecting a definitive uh, measure 
of syndromal responses to cannabis as we do this. We've already had 6,000 patients register an interest since we made the announcement uh, just a, a little while back. Uh, we've got five clinics now linking with us, so they will be prescribing and entering data into our database. We also have independent clinicians, and one point I would make to all of you who are listening, who are prescribers, feel free. If you want to become a prescriber, please just send me an email, d.nut at imperial.ac.uk, and I will forward that to the team. So here it is, here's a picture from our website. You can also go on the website and refer patients or access us through there. That's a Project 2021 webpage. There's a little bit of bud, which uh, we're not gonna be using, but it just reminds you what cannabis looks like if you can't remember. And uh, here's the patient chart, which again, you'll find on the website. So if patients approach you, you basically can put them onto that website and uh, encourage them to work through it. Ideally, Work through it with them, please. So that's what I wanted to say. I'll take questions now and just I'll leave this up. Um, if you want any more information, go on our website, drugscience.org.uk. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. It's um, an excellent run through some of the previous and, and current policy and some of the issues that we might be getting. Um, I ran the little poll during that and we actually just over 50 percent 56 percent in fact of our attendees tonight had been asked by patients uh, right. about medical cannabis and we're now going to put the other one up which is um how um how would you feel about prescribing and would you be interested in prescribing medical cannabis Oh, that's a that's a very interesting, very interesting deal. Almost two thirds of people saying yes, and an, an, another third not sure. Um, so quite quite a strong response there. Um, so I think there's definitely going to be some interest in some of the questions we've got for you. Uh, well, we better have uh, questions for the ones that uh, that don't know. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Hopefully, yes. Although a couple of comments, and some of them obviously. Uh, I mean, one one was really going back to the very beginning of, of the um, the vilification really and and uh, you know it was this driven by racism vilifying do you think is that the, the key part or was it primarily around someone losing his job oh it's well of course it was uh, it was the losing the job but yeah there's no better way of getting people to support an initiative than by focusing on a racial stereotype and a, a minority group uh, that was the first, actually. I mean, it, it, they attacked the Mexicans. They also attacked jazz players as well. I mean, um, there was a, quite a lot of prosecution. I mean, jazz emerged in, in New Orleans in the 20s because of the use of cannabis. I think there was some, some hatred of, uh, of jazz taking over from more conventional American music. And ever since then, of course, we've seen minority groups, you know, blacks have been vilified for using heroin and cocaine. So it's all part of the sort of policy. All drug, all drug policies ever pretty much have been driven by a, a politics and politics you know, likes to attack people that both are poor and don't vote yeah i think it's very true isn't it that the that the, the war on drugs uh, continues to vilify people uh, and and people from bme commu communities have a particularly hard time in, in that uh, and I, I unfortunately i don't see that changing unless we get around to to, to actually restructuring and, 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 and removing some of the, the criminality that, that then that fosters and causes future problems. Oh, but yeah, it's great. It's a great policy because it, um, it puts people into the situation where all they can do is do drugs. So it becomes a self-fulfilling philosophy and that's why it's so reprehensible really. Indeed. And do, um, do we have any contact with um, uh, prescribers in other countries at the moment supporting some of these initiatives or who um, perhaps uh, clinicians in the UK could could make contact with uh, in the situation of wanting to provide absolutely let me say a few things about that so we, our team uh, have been over to Canada to, to work with spend time with prescribers in Canada to get experience and, uh, I think the, the Canadians uh, who, who have helped us would be more than happy to help other uh, Brits who wanted to go across and learn. That's the first thing. Second thing to say is we have been 
digging into the Canadian database to try to reassure British doctors that some of their worst fears aren't founded. So, for instance, this fear that um, cannabis medicines will cause psychosis. I think there's one reported case in the whole of the Canadian database, which is, I think, over 10,000 prescriptions. And that's not surprising because, uh, firstly, if they're being prescribed, and hopefully the doctors won't be prescribing them to people who've got florid psychosis. Uh, and secondly, as I said, they're getting a lot of people are getting strong CBD medicines, low THC, which is not going to cause psychosis, might even treat it. And the other big fear is dependence. And what's interesting about the Canadian experience is that, is it around about half of people stop after six months. Now, whether that if that's I don't know if that's because they're better or whether because the, dr the drugs stop working. But what it does tell us is that our people aren't getting to their doctor to keep getting cannabis to keep them still. They're not dependent. They wouldn't be giving up. You don't see that kind of thing when you're using, say, opiates. Mm. Yes, I think those of us who prescribe opiates in primary care would uh, tend to agree with you on that one. So, uh, so the current evidence base uh, is mainly based on um, studies um, from other countries because we've been so sort of far behind in the UK. Um, but right. you feel that there's sufficient to uh, support uh, individual practitioners who, who, who want to prescribe um, cannabis-based medical products. Uh, and and because obviously a lot of, particularly GPs, will feel even if it's been initiated by a specialist, they may be putting themselves on something of a limb if they, uh, if they continue, uh, you know, continue those prescriptions. Well, I think the first thing I would say is... Uh, I'll defend anyone. If there's any problems, I'll defend you because uh, I believe strongly. I mean, the evidence is, it is kind of, it's weird that we've got so much. I, I like to, in my, if you read my BMJ essay, I, I reflect on the origins of another plant medicine or plant-derived medicine, which is called penicillin. And when penicillin came along, everyone was desperate to get to use it because you know, it was saving people's lives. It was really helping. Uh, there wasn't a clamor to say, well, I'm not going to use it for, you know, until someone's had a double blind control trial. There probably never was one with penicillin. But people are holding cannabis to a very different standard, even though it was a medicine to them. And, and the reasons for that are kind of complex and, and they're not, it's not just politics. It's also that a lot of the medical profession have kind of jumped on a bandwagon of cannabis is bad, you know, and that they've been educating themselves and, and, and their families and doctors that cannabis is a dangerous drug, but, but actually, if you use it correctly, it isn't. So I suspect in 10, 20 years' time, most of most doctors will be prescribing cannabis and benefiting their patients, but also re not just by the benefits of cannabis, but also by reducing the use of other medications like opiates and, uh, and, and anti-epilepsy drugs. And the third thing I would say is, you know, again, I've written this in my essay. You know, as a, you know, I'm a psychiatrist. I used to treat people with really complex, difficult, untreatable conditions. And if any of them came along to me and said, oh, by the way, I found something that helped me, I'd have grasped it with both hands. So when patients are coming to you and saying that, you know, they're actually they're dealing well with their chronic pain or with their multiple sclerosis or their PTSD with can cannabinoids, I would, I would think, great. Let's do, a, you know, let's do a proper clinical evaluation. You know, let's prescribe something where I know what the provenance is. I know what the concentration, and the ratios are, and let's just see. Let's, you know, and that way, you know, you'll, you know, you'll teach them whether they're right, but you'll also learn a lot yourself. Yes, uh, I suppose also the fact that the, the way it's administered is is not something that we're particularly um, used to. Uh, you know, in the UK as GPs, and uh, yeah, and obviously you've got a botanical product which is a variety of lots of different um, compounds. And you know, given in, in mind that we, you know, we, we still even haven't got round to the old poly pill for people of our age uh, <laughs> with the statins and the aspirins and everything else, uh, I think that might have some some effects with with clinicians. Well, I think you're right. I think, but that all isn't doesn't that all come from a sort of combination of um, of ignorance and, and 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 lack of education, but also a sort of clinging on to the view. I mean, and I, which I find really quite weird. You know, the clinging on to the view that the only 
justifiable data set you might have for prescribing is one that has been produced by a pharmaceutical company at enormous expense, doing a double-blind controlled trial in people you will never see anyway because they've ex eliminated every comorbidity, uh, and producing a drug which is too expensive to prescribe. I mean, if that's really what British medicine wants, well, you know, I'm not surprised people have kind of given up because because we're not we're never going to get that. The the cannabis plant, plant-based cannabis medicines, contain hundreds of different substances. You can't take them all out and test each one in the you know in the different ratios. It, it will never happen. I mean, it won't happen for two reasons. One is because it's too damn expensive and difficult, and the second is because you can't patent the plant. So relying, waiting for conventional pharmaceutical development in mm. cannabis medicines means you will wait forever and patients will be very disadvantaged. So we have to think differently. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's true. I mean, lots of medicines that are derived from plants, we've had a very reductionist approach, haven't we? Trying to isolate the molecule that does the thing that we want it to do. Uh, and actually, uh, and it seems very much the case with cannabis, from what, from what you're saying, that it's actually the balance between the various molecules that sometimes uh, produces the beneficial effects. And, and well, therefore, to reduce that out isn't necessarily the right approach. That's a very important point, Steve. Yeah, I think we call it the entourage effect. And that it, there is not good evidence, but some evidence that you can, the different plant products can augment each other and so you get more than the, uh, the sum of the individuals. That's the first thing. Just remember, just reflect on why, how the last 150 years of modern medicine was about taking plants, you know, willow bark, opium, extracting the active ingredient and then making that a medicine. That wasn't done for the benefit of patients. That was done so the companies could have a patent. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we know we've got so hung up. We've got, you know, we, we it's, yeah, you know me. You know, you know, I'm quite positive about the pharma industry, but I don't think we should be completely enslaved to this myth that they, unless a pharma company does a controlled trial, evidence is there's no evidence. You know, and what, you know, and, and they won't. I told you, come pharma companies will not do these trials. The government won't do these trials because they're too expensive and difficult. So. The reality is you either have to try it out yourself as a, as a GP or as a prescriber uh, and, and see what happens, get experience with it, or, or not do it at all. And not doing it at all is potentially depriving yourself of, one of what could be one of the greatest advances in medicine in our lifetime. Yes. So uh, it is an interesting point, isn't it, how the, these uh, naturally occurring compounds have, uh, recept we have receptors in our bodies that whether they're, they're, they're opioid receptors, whether they're endocannabinoids, that, that, that they act upon them. So, I mean, do you think we've, is there a reason why we've evolved an endocannabinoid system or? Yeah, it's a very, it's, um, yeah, and it's not to do with the cannabis plant. The cannabis plant has kind of accidentally made things which work in that system. The endocannabinoid is a very primitive old system. It's, it's, as I say, it's the, the endocannabinoids come from cell membranes. So they're, they're basically metabolic products of cell membranes. So that ever since there have been cell membranes, these kind of little offshoots are being made. One of the interesting things about them is that uh, they seem to have a homeostatic purpose. And some people call them adaptogens. Mm -hmm. And it seems, and this is quite fascinating in the context of uh, how... Sometimes, you know, you can see, see effects in almost what you might call almost paradoxical effects in, in, in disorders which should be opposite, but the cannabinoids can have uh, effects at both ends of the spectrum. And that's because they seem to normalize functionality of, uh, of cell transmission uh, in a way. So they, they can restore deficits, but they can also somehow dampen down excesses. And, the, and this is, I mean, it's hard to prove, but this is quite an interesting con concept, this adaptogen. And uh, I mean, one of the interesting examples for ha is that um, hey, everyone who smoked cannabis knows about the munchies. And people think, people assume, oh, well, if you're going to, you know, if people get the munchies using, and, and you will, if your medical cannabis can start off giving you an increase in appetite. But over time, people lose weight. In fact, there's an interest, you know, there's, it's quite, it's, it, I would not be surprised if in 10 years' time we're talking about the use of medical cannabis for diabetes. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
that's a, in, in, a very interesting. And, and obviously, so, uh, there's a wide range of, of, of physical conditions that are being suggested that medical medical cannabis may be of benefit for. Uh, and I suppose it's only with time and use that we'll start to see the ones that have a uh, a, a better uh, or, or more pro pronounced effect. Uh, in interestingly, our next um, webinar is going to be on uh, pa uh, cannabis in chronic pain and pain control. Um, do you think that this uh, homeostasis effect might be why possibly some mental health conditions may be suitable um, for treatment with medical cannabis? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's um, yeah. I mean, most there's a sort of a supposition that all all you're doing is stoning yourself, so you don't kind of have the thoughts or the the anxieties. But in fact, it may well be much more subtle than that. I mean, you look at a condition like PTSD. Well, PTSD is a is a condition where a major event happens. It is very unpleasant or life threatening. Your brain cannot unlearn that because brains are wired to remember very important things and you can't stop thinking about it you're in a, a repetitive mode of continually uh, fighting back the, the, the scary memories and the emotions that go with it now the endocannabinoid system like, potentially can slowly put back the that profound alteration in glutamate transition and transmission which underlies the the very deeply embedded memories and slowly I think slowly put back the uh, the uh, reverberations in that circuit back to where they were before so at the very least in the emotional circuit when you do have the memory you don't get the enormous overswell of emotions as, uh, at the same time so so I think it's 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 completely plausible and, and it, it we just need a lot more research and uh, yeah, I showed you that graph the the, the attack on cannabis uh, recreationally has severely impeded research in Britain. In fact, we've continued to do it. I mean, what we've got worse in the last few years when we started to try to um, test prisoners for smoking cannabis and that, that led to the rise of spice. And the government has now banned uh, most drugs which you can use to work on the cannabis receptor. So actually we're going through another dark age of cannabis research. Again, because of the hysteria over um, recreation we use. But undoubtedly, over time, and in countries, I mean, Israel is leading the world, um, the US is catching up. Countries which have invested strongly in medical cannabis growth and research are reaping not just the financial rewards from, from the medicine, but also the scientific rewards too. And that's really sad because one thing I should have said the endocannabinoid system one of the key players, the UK was one of the great players in this, Roger Pertwee up in Aberdeen, he was one of the great pioneers of, of this discovery and uh, we discovered many of the natural products in the cannabis plant. We have not, not actually turned any one of our discoveries into a product because it's too difficult to work with them in this country under the current legislation. So, I mean, and obviously, the, 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 as you say, the regulation around this is, is quite complex. I think it's not something um, most GPs will be very familiar with. Um, at the moment, my understanding is if a specialist initiates it, then a primary care physician, GP, can continue that prescription, um, yes. albeit, you know, um, without some of the, of the of the safety netting that we would get with other other drugs um, but how do you see the role for primary care developing if, if if what you're trying to do is is very successful and you're able to prove the benefit uh, across this many thousands of patients that you're hoping to work with um, do you feel that primary care may in the future have a role in in initiating this in various oh, well, in, in, in most countries where they're, it, they are established medicines, it, I mean, these are great medicines for primary care because they're easy to use and they're very, very safe. <laughs> so I think primary care, you know, in the end, the, these will become staples of primary care. But the, your question was what to do at present, and, and it's a challenge, and there are several things. The first thing would be, if you're interested, then kind of link up, get, we can put you in contact with local clinics, go and learn, you know, you have to get your own special pink prescription pad because government decided, you know, that 
could, you had to have a special pad for cannabis just in case, you know, you were um, prescribing it to people who shouldn't have it so they could monitor you. But it, I think, it, I think you know, you'd have to, you'd, it would be, it's not trivial because, and in fact, I don't think you want to get to become a sort of sole um, provider because of the, 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 reg, the regulations for the importation, finding pharmacies and that would be very difficult for a GP. But if you linked up with a, a clinic, uh, I think you could you'd find it actually fascinating and also rewarding. Good, excellent. So, um, so what about patients who are buying cannabis illicitly? How do, how do we support them? Uh, obviously, given that we can't then immediately turn around and write a pink, pink prescription for them. No, quite. Well, please suggest that they. Go onto the website and try if they if they've got one of the disorders that we are studying, could they go onto the website, go through the flowchart, and hopefully get assessed by in one of the clinics, and then they would be in the system. Now, what we've done is we have priced uh, the, the cannabis prescription at 150 pounds a month because that is the average spend in the black market by someone who is getting medical cannabis. Of course, you'll get much better quality product, and it will be the right kind of product if you go through this. Um, it's still not cheap. I mean, you know, it's not free. If as many of your patients will be having, uh, you know, completely free prescriptions, but it uh, it's definitely preferable. And you you know you won't be getting offered crack and heroin at the same time, and and you won't you know this, you won't be having to run the risk of being arrested and having your assets seized by the police because they accuse you of being a dealer. So there's a lot a lot of merit. So if if you can get them to sign up and uh, and uh, and, then, and actually I should say beyond that we're, we're, we're hoping to have several thousand uh, patients who are treated completely free because if they can't afford the 150 a month we do have a kind of compassionate scheme which we're developing as well oh okay that's that's useful now so uh, and so do we some interesting questions I, I think the your your Discussion around the endocannabinoid system has sparked quite a bit of interest and quite a few questions. Um, so people are, do we have any ways of assessing whether people's system is act, overactive, underactive? Is the, uh, if people are particularly sensitive to cannabis, would this suggest they have a higher natural um, activity in the, in the system or a lower, I, I, you know, people are super, super, super question, yeah. And the answer is there's, you know, we don't know, we don't have the tools. You can measure stuff in the plasma and people are beginning to do that. You can measure, there's been some quite interesting work doing CSF levels of anandamide showing, interestingly, and this is that as people get better from schizophrenia, the levels go up, suggesting that's the way the, it's not causing psychosis, it's treating psychosis. But that, again, suggests that there's an adaptogen, you know, it's, it's, it's healing the brain somehow. We can measure the receptors in the brain using scans, but they're very, very expensive, and they're not really quantitative yet. So, now this is a field of medicine that is in it really in its infancy, and it, there will be an explosion of knowledge over the next 20 years or so. There's a little bit of work also around the enzymes. I didn't show you all the slides on on the endocannabinoids, how there are there are enzymes which make them, and there are enzymes which break them down, and there are um, interesting genetic conditions. I mean, you may have heard about a Scottish woman who was admitted to the hospital about 18 months ago with a broken leg but no pain. Yes. And she's never had pain and that's because she has a, 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 a defect in the enzyme that breaks down 2-AG, so she's got chronically high levels of 2-AG, so she's pain-free. So there are these interesting clinical observations which kind of prove that this system is relevant. Mm -hmm. And companies are making that. There's, there are companies trying to develop enzyme inhibitors to enhance endocannabinoids as a way of uh, perhaps treating some of the disorders. Whether they'll be more effective than um, taking plant-based cannabinoids, we don't know yet. And uh, a couple of questions suggesting: Is there a role for medical cannabis? around substance misuse treatment so people who may have cannabis addiction or may have addictions to to other substances yeah it's a really exciting area at present we know that the cannabis receptor is certainly from animal studies the cannabis receptor and the opiate receptor 
seem to work in unison. And if you knock out the cannabis receptor in a mouse, then it's less, it doesn't like heroin so much. <coughs> so there's clearly some crosstalk. Now, a couple of things to say about that. There are, um, there are trials going on now using both THC and CBD as a way of trying to ameliorate uh, withdrawal from, um, from opiates. A very, very elegant study done by uh, Tom Freeman and Val Curran at UCL. They use CBD, this kind of antidote to THC, to treat people with uh, THC dependency, skunk dependency. And they found they could significantly reduce the use of THC by treating them with, uh, with cannabidiol. So uh, that was, that's a, this is a very promising area. And it's, you can also, of course, you can treat street cannabis use by prescribed cannabis. And that's one of the things we're looking at. We think we might, we're hoping that we could start to make some impact. This terrible problem we have of spice in prisons with, you know, 70 people dying last year of spice and having to have, you know, whole little troops of paramedics in prisons to stop people going crazy. We're hoping we might be able to get people off the spice and putting them onto something like a strong, a high CBD, low THC mixture. So that's an area. It's very controversial. I'm not sure the current government is actually going to allow us to do studies in prison, but I think in the end, you know, it would have to come. Indeed. I mean, I, I, yes, it, I, as you say, it's certainly a, maybe a potentially controversial area, but, it, but it's something that from, certainly from a, the harm reductionist in, in uh, sees as, as as sensible given the the, the, the huge damage and, and from what I'm, I'm picking up on this and, um, and, and my prior knowledge that cannabis really is a fairly safe plant I mean I know you did a, a huge piece of work on the relative harms um, between the various drugs which didn't always go down well with some of your employers but the so on that scale how where would you you place cannabis in terms of you know, one can, uh, not zero, a hundred percent safe to 10, the worst drug ever invented as per the uh, DEA in the thirties. Yes. Well, I love this. Uh, I love the, there's this wonderful sort of uh, factoid, which says that um, in order to kill yourself with cannabis, you'd have to have someone put like a hundred kilos on your chest so you start breathing. That's the only way you're going to kill yourself with cannabis. <laughs> so yeah, no, I mean, of course it's not completely safe. It can raise, if you've got heart problems, uh, smoking cannabis can give you a peak in the blood, which can cause um, angina. Uh, you can, some people do get paranoid, some people do get nauseous. Uh, but it's, it's, it's definitely a long, it, it, well, and if you get rid of THC, if you just look at cannabidiol, which, you know, is one of them, it's so the, the go-to treatment now for these children with epilepsy, I mean, it's, it's extraordinarily safe. I don't think it's hard to imagine you could ever kill yourself with it unless you choke on it. But with, I mean, and would there be any very specific drug interactions with, um, if we were to be continuing a prescription with patients that we might be using this in? Uh, so high dose kind of a dial, yeah, the, 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 it does have some interaction with the P450s. Uh, but then you talk, you see, with kind of a dial for epilepsy, you're talking about up to a gram a day. Whereas for THC, for multiple sclerosis, it's like, you know, five milligrams. So there are very few interactions with THC. Okay. And then uh, we're getting to the end, so I'm, I'm going to have to wrap up with one last one. Um, uh, given everything that's gone on, what would you say on wider drug policy? What would outcomes would you like to see from the UK-wide summit uh, that's going to take place in Glasgow later this month? I'd like to see a rational policy based on evidence with harm reduction at its core. I think that's a great way to end. David, thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, for tuning in. Uh, I again just want to thank David um, for that really informative talk. There are questions I haven't been able to get and put to you. There have been so many, so many questions tonight. It, it's been a great response from you as the audience as well. Uh, I hope therefore that we will see you for the subsequent um, webinars in this series. Uh, I hope some of you may as well may as well tune in for our uh, next premium membership webinar in March, which is falling between services uh, and look, prescribing, providing integrated care for older people with alcohol, alcohol problems, which is being presented by Dr. Tony Rao. Uh, and with that, um, it leaves me only to wish you all um, a good night.
and uh, hopefully see you all in the future. Thank you.